from early computer networks. But first, I'm going to talk about data sharing without a network, or so-called sneaker net, and illustrate some of the challenges that caused computer networks to come into being. In order to do this, let's start by traveling into the past. This is an old IBM style PC. I didn't have one of these exactly, but I had a system that was uh, probably slightly newer than this as my first computer. And like this computer, internal system didn't have a hard drive. So what we had instead were external floppy drives and all the programs and all the data we were going to use at the computer had to be stored on floppy disks that would be plugged into the computer at runtime in order to run software and access data. These early personal computers were isolated from each other. This is simply a workstation that was plugged into a wall outlet for electrical power and there was no network communication between systems. In order to run a program, you would take the floppy disk containing that program, put it in the drive, run the program off the floppy drive. Similarly, you would save data to a floppy disk and retrieve that data from that same floppy disk later, and that's how you would manage your files, is they would simply be on a floppy drive, and you'd access the file, work on it, save the file back to disk. If you wanted to get data from one of these workstations to another, it would save the data on the disk, remove it from the first computer, remove the disk that is, carry the disk to the second computer, insert the disk into the second computer, and access the data. Looking backwards, these things were euphemistically called sneaker nets, because you would put the data onto an external storage medium, put your sneakers on, carry that data where it needed to go, and then access it from that external medium. In some situations, we actually still use sneaker nets today. When moving extremely large data sets, for example, it's often more efficient to store those large data sets on an external disk or on tape and move them from machine to machine or system to system than it is to send them over the network. And this is especially true with backups and other extremely large data sets. In addition, certain systems are high security. That means that we don't want them connected to the network either to prevent data that's stored on them, say classified data, from leaking out, or to prevent, for example, malware, for conducting malware research or malware testing, from leaking out and infecting other systems on the network. And so those types of systems may be isolated from each other. The only way to get data into and out of such systems is with some kind of external storage medium. In addition, for high sensitivity classified operations, or in the case of criminals, for criminal operations, it is easier to avoid detection by utilizing external media, such as a USB flash drive, and simply moving that from system to system, then sending the data over the network where someone might observe it. That said, there are a number of limitations to a sneaker net. For one, it's inefficient for moving small quantities of data. It's highly inefficient for things like email. If I'm going to send an email message to a colleague in another office in my building, it's far more efficient for me to simply call that colleague or go speak to that colleague in person than it is to type an email message, save it on a disk or a USB drive, carry it to that colleague, and then have the colleague retrieve it from the drive, read it, put a reply, type it onto that same medium, give it back to me. Similarly, the World Wide Web as we know it wouldn't work because web pages are not efficiently transmitted this way. Uh, for example, if you want to look up a web page about a product, it's far more effective to simply go to the store and look at the product and see the literature in person than it is to wait for somebody to mail you a flash drive containing a page about that pro product. In addition, a sneaker net requires mechanical intervention. So this is in the form of a human or a robot or a trained animal like a carrier pigeon to carry data from one place to another. Mechanical intervention such as this is much more prone to breaking down than electronic communication systems. 
so connecting systems together electronically is more efficient for many purposes, and that's why we have networks. But how did we get here? Well, early on, the earliest computer networks were found during the Cold War between the United States and the Soviet Union. The United States, in the late 1950s, had many defense stations located nationwide with radar stations to detect potential incoming Soviet aircraft that might be delivering nuclear weapons. So an early idea and an early motivation for computer network was to link together the different radar terminals and command centers so that we had early attack warning capability and defense coordination so that defenses and counter attacks could be launched effectively and quickly. These early networks relied on existing telephone systems that already were in place to connect computers together, and they used modulator demodulator or modem hardware in order to accomplish the connections. The earliest system was SAGE, which was begun in 1958, or was originally commissioned in 1958, and this was called the Semi-Automatic Ground Environment. And what this system did is it linked together radar tracking, defense command, and some basic weapons guidance systems so that counterattacks and defenses could be more effectively coordinated. This system was in operation until 1980 when it was replaced by the Joint Surveillance System and also part of the modern FAA air traffic control system. So this eventually did lead into civilian system. Here is a radar terminal for SAGE, and you can see there are quite a few analog switches and buttons, as well as what's called a light gun, that's this device here, that could be used for pointing to targets on the screen. It was recognized fairly early on that there would be commercial applications for this type of system, and that came in the form of Sabre. Sabre was a system for connecting mainframes and teleprinters together in order to automate flight reservations for American Airlines. This system was highly successful and continued to evolve over the years until American finally parted way with Sabre Holdings, the company that owned the system, in 2000. That company, Sabre Holdings, still exists and they own Travelocity. So that roaming gnome that you see in the Travelocity commercials, in the United States at least, is an evolution of this Sage technology commercialized as Sabre. In 1969, the U.S. Defense Department Advanced Research Projects Agency, or ARPA, what later became DARPA, connected different universities and research centers together using a novel form of networking called packet switching. Talk more about what that is in later lectures, but the basic idea was that they leased telephone lines and used computer modems to link together a whole bunch of different research sites at once. This system allowed university researchers to communicate with each other electronically and exchange information much more quickly. The National Science Foundation took over the system and enhanced it in 1990 as NSFNet. And in 1995, this, this system was fully commercialized and is now known as the Internet. So this was the precursor to the modern day Internet. In the 1970s and then commercially in 1980, Ethernet was developed. This was developed by Xerox Corporation at their Parallel Architectures Research Center. And the idea of this system was that instead of using telephone modems to connect remote systems together, Ethernet would allow local computers at a single site, geographically close together, to be linked together at higher speed. This was called a local area network. It was significantly faster and less complex than trying to use modems and telephone lines to link together a bunch of machines that were all geographically local to each other. It was also relatively cheap to implement, which led to its eventual commercial success. Today, an outgrowth of this, Gigabit Ethernet is the current standard, 
but 10 gigabit Ethernet is readily available and 100 gigabit Ethernet is in development. This is a far cry from the original Ethernet which was 2 megabits and that's megabits by the way not gigabits and uh, the original commercial implementation that saw widespread use at 10 megabits per second. So today, with all this technology, networks are everywhere. Every commodity computer, tablet, cell phone, even some smart household appliances are connected to a network and potentially to the internet. The fundamental purpose remains the same today, though, as the original Sage and Sabre systems. The idea here is to share data between different systems, between different devices, and do so in an efficient way that can't be realized by sharing data via external storage media. So to summarize, without networks we would still be carrying data from system to system by means of the sneaker net. This would not enable efficient communication of small amounts of data. So things like the internet would not exist. The original Sage and Sabre systems provided the earliest connections of computers together with electronic communication for real-time data sharing. ARPANET was an outgrowth of those systems and the precursor to the modern internet, and original Ethernet laid the foundation for local area networks that made connectivity into the internet possible. ARPANET and Ethernet arguably laid the foundation for today's interconnected world of devices.